Some of you may have heard of the Conquest of Elysium games, but most of you probably haven't. It's a little difficult to describe what they are. It feels a bit like a roguelike, but it's also a strategy game. It comes from Illwinter Studios, the same people who make Dominions, although I like Dominions a lot more than I like Conquest of Elysium. That doesn't mean that Conquest of Elysium isn't fun, it's pretty good too. Just like in the Dominions games, every Conquest of Elysium game improves on the last one without changing the formula too much. I'm one game behind because I have the third game, and the newest game is the fourth game. The fourth game has much more interesting combat than the third game. Just like in Dominions, the outcomes of the battles aren't really determined by you. What happens is you have your unit composition, and it enters a battle, and you just spectate the combat. That doesn't bother me, but it might bother some of you who want more control. What you're watching is essentially a replay of the battle, and you can speed it up or slow it down. For this reason, the way you set up your unit composition is very important. Sometimes battles may not go according to plan, but the one thing you can control is what kind of units you have and make sure that they're in a good mix that complements each other. So planning is key. You can choose to generate a world or to use an existing map. Existing maps are probably created using the map editor, but I've never tried this. Random maps is fine for me, but it's nice to have the option. When generating a random map, you have some options for the world generation, map size and society. Map size is pretty self-explanatory, but society could do with some explaining. Society determines, in a way, the age of the world. It controls what features and special tiles the world has. It reminds me a bit of the world's age and war fortress where the older the world is, the more developed it is, with more cities, towers, etc. This is similar. Choosing Dark Ages will make a map that's mostly untouched by man and civilization. Mythical creatures like dragons, fairy courts, and dwarven cities will be abundant, while human cities will be few and far between, and very small. Most of the map will be forested, and nature will be strong. Ancient ruins will also be present. On the other hand, choosing empire will create the world during the height of human prosperity. The lands will be largely deforested, human settlements, cities and towns will be abundant, and mythical creatures are much rarer. Most of my playthroughs have been during the Dark Ages or Fallen Empire. Fallen Empire is nice because the lands are littered with the remnants of the Fallen Empire. Battlegrounds are abundant and full of dead to be raised, and the formerly huge cities of the Empire have fallen into ruin. They're often inhabited by undead or demons, and what little of humanity remains is being reclaimed by nature. So the forests and trees are coming back. Either way, whatever society you choose of the six available, all are great in their own way and offer some replay value. Moving on, we come to the classes or races. There's plenty of options, and you'll notice some overlap with dominions here. For example, Pale Ones and Bakemono are races and dominions. Every one of these classes plays completely differently, and I haven't tried them all. But my personal favorites are the Necromancer, the Witch, the Warlock, and the Enchanter. Of all of these, somewhat surprisingly, the Necromancer is not my favorite. Enchanter is my favorite. I'll cover all of them briefly and then focus on the Necromancer because this is the Necromancer channel after all. Before I begin on the classes, a brief mention about the seasons in the game. There's four seasons, winter, spring, summer, and autumn, just like in real life. Depending on the class you choose, they can be good or bad. In winter, rivers and lakes will also freeze over, allowing passage where passage would normally not be possible. First, we'll look at the witch. The witch's resource is fungi. Every forest tile under her control generates fungi per turn, which she collects. Swamp tiles are the most lucrative for fungi. During autumn, all output is doubled. During spring and summer, the normal collection rate occurs, and during winter, no fungi is produced at all. Using the fungi resource, the witch can summon all kinds of bizarre swamp creatures and horrors. 
These are very powerful units since some can cost hundreds of fungi each. Optionally, you can choose to spend more or less fungi per ritual. The more you spend, the more likely you're able to take control of the summon, and the less you spend, the more likely the summon will turn, turn against you after you summon it, and you have a battle on your hands. As the witch, your goal is to control as much of the forest as possible. Next, we've got the warlock. The warlock's resource is gems, which he gets from occupying mines and some other sites like volcanoes. The stream of gems is pretty constant, but comes in different elemental kinds. Fire gems, earth gems, air gems, etc. The gems you get is, seems to be random, depending between the mines. You might find a silver mine that gives you one kind, and another silver mine that gives you another kind. Using these gems, he can summon elementals. The more gems, the stronger the elemental. The warlock apprentices can be trained to make different kinds of specializations. And uh, the more specialized the apprentice becomes, the less variety he can summon, but the stronger the elemental. So at max level, a fire warlock can only summon fire units, but they're very strong. Whereas a weaker or unleveled apprentice can summon all of the weaker ones from all of the different kinds of elements. The elementals are pretty damn strong, but can be caught by units immune to their type. For this reason, having access to multiple kinds of gems and different kinds of warlocks is wise. What I mean is you might find uh, a creature that's immune to fire, and if, if all you've got is fire elementals, then you're in hot water. Next we've got the Enchanter, which is my favourite class to play. And he kind of makes use of resources in an awful, non-renewable way to create powerful constructs. Each one of them is extremely strong, but has inherent weaknesses and most of them never heal. Trees and forests can be consumed to create wood golems, leaving behind destroyed forests which are useless to druids and witches. The wood golems are the weakest of the golems, but are still very strong, but with a weakness to fire. Iron mines are consumed to create iron golems, which are pretty damn strong in every possible respect. Gold mines produce gold golems, and so on and so forth. Swamps can be consumed to create clay golems, which are weak compared to other golems, but regenerate health constantly during combat. Alternatively, the enchanter can use swamps to create terracotta soldiers. These are weak, but can be pumped out in mass. The issue is that every time you make the soldiers, it has a chance to destroy the swamp resource. Sometimes that happens after a single use if you're very unlucky, or other times the swamp can just keep on giving hundreds of soldiers. So it's a risky prospect and a bit of a gamble. Ponds are useless to the enchanter during all seasons except winter. In winter they can be consumed to create an ice golem, which is very tough. There's a few other kinds of golems the enchanter can make, but it's always at the cost of a special tile that produces a lot of money or iron or some other resource, so it becomes kind of a balancing act. This isn't a problem when raiding enemy territory though. You can walk straight in, conquer his precious sites and transform them into golems and leave him with devastated, useless terrain. The enchanter can also opt for sustainable but weaker forces. Animated suits of armor, flying scimitars, gargoyles, all of these can be created using just gold and iron, which accumulates from mines. Necrotods cost 35 gold and can be made from dead humans. They look like a spinal column with a skull on top. Their attack is that they dance to hypnotize the enemy and can charm them to your side. If you have a lot of necrotods, you can convert heaps of the enemies every battle and get a large army. Now we come to the Necromancer. The Necromancer is fun but difficult to play. Your resource is called Hands of Glory, which is produced by gallows and towns and cities. These are hands cut from hanged murderers. The resource can be spent on summoning powerful undead. There's two ways to summon as a Necromancer. The first is to use the Hands of Glory to summon more powerful kinds of undead. This is safe but expensive, because your hands of glory take a long time to accumulate. 
The second way is to find a recent battleground or ruined city, somewhere where you get the message, the presence of the dead is strong here, when you click your special ability. Summoning in this way will create large numbers of lesser undead. However, every time you summon undead, you lose some sanity. For this reason, you want your main characters to summon as little as possible. Instead, your necromancer apprentices should be used to do all the dirty work like summoning, because it will slowly turn them insane. Insane units will be uncontrollable for a time. And the more insane they are, the more uncontrollable they become, and the longer they stay uncontrollable. After some time, an apprentice is rendered almost completely useless. He'll decide to sit where he is, refusing to move and refusing to summon. Insane apprentices will get the red background on them. The insane apprentices may still be useful, though, because under a commander they still act and cast spells like a normal unit would. The days of roaming around freely as a commander and summoning may be over though. A good strategy might be to take large numbers of apprentices with you. Even if all of them are utterly insane, there's a chance that when you release them, one of them may keep his sanity long enough to raise the undead. Even if they can't, you've still got many casters in your army. You can sure control a lot of undead and lots of very cool units summoned using the Hands of Glory. But of all of the classes I mentioned in this game, I've had most difficulty with the Necromancer. It's just a hard one to play. Apprentices are expensive and usually in short supply. So you have to make sure your income is good to first of all be able to purchase the apprentices as they rarely appear, but also to support a standing army of living troops. This is in case you are unable to find apprentices to make undead ones or are unable to find corpses, or are unable to gain a lot of Hand of Glory generation to get decent units with. The undead minions you can create has a lot of overlap with the ones in Dominions. You've got the bog standard troops like Soulless and Long Dead, which are basically zombies and skeletons. Summoning from a battlefield will give you special kinds of undead, like fancy armored and tough skeletons called Dust Warriors. There's different kinds as well. Summoning using the Hands of Glory will produce powerful units like the Ziz, a huge undead bird. Just like in Dominions, undead do not heal, so you might have a nice Ziz that you've summoned up, but if he's seen a few battles, he may have one hit point left and get killed by a common bandit. So, all in all, Conquest of Elysium is a solid necromancer game. But it offers other classes that are great fun as well if you're into summoning of any kind at all. It's not for everyone. The graphics, as you've probably seen, might turn some people off. But where this game shines, in my opinion, isn't its gameplay. Every unit kind of has its own story to it. You might have one soldier that survives many battles and accumulates afflictions over time, just like in Dominions. He might lose an eye or lose a leg and deal less damage or be less accurate. And sometimes you can have soldiers that are alive for so long that they just become like complete cripples when you look at their injuries. Like you might click a guy and he's missing both arms, both legs, he's blinded, he's got like brain damage and it's just kind of funny that these guys can just linger on for so long in an army. So yeah, if that looks interesting to you then I'd recommend you get the fourth game because it's got much better combat than this one. You've seen in, in, in the background uh, gameplay that I've been playing that you know the combat's kind of um, just unexciting in a way. But in the fourth game if you look on the Steam page you'll see screenshots of what the combat's like. It's much, much better. I'll pick up the fourth game eventually too when I've got a bit of money to throw around. Another good thing about this game is that it's truly cross-platform. It'll run on Mac. For example, Windows, uh, Linux, but also interestingly, and very usefully for me, it runs on the ARM processor architecture. Well, that means that you can host this game on a Raspberry Pi, which is a very energy efficient way of um, hosting a game to play with someone on. You can put a little uh, VPN on your Raspberry Pi and uh, you can have a very extended game with someone that could last months. Um, 
I haven't done that too often with this game, but I've done it with Dominions, which is the other game from this developer. And me and my sister, we live on different continents. But, you know, every day after coming from home from work, I'd uh, log in, do a, a round, and the pie would, you know, crunch the numbers, probably take like five minutes to calculate a turn. And then that would be that for the day. And I'd come home the next day and there'd be another turn waiting for me. So it's a great game like that just to play over a longer period of time with someone. Anyway, hope you enjoyed watching. See you later.